Yeah, you have to be smarter than the machine, and today I am that. I'm Todd Wyman from the Cass County Extension Office, and um, thank you for not leaving before I started. Um, many people say, why do we, why, do, why have a container garden? You know, it's just a little tiny thing. Why do it? Um, many people do not have the option of having a garden. If you've ever rented before or, or have a, um, a property where you can't dig into, um, I'm yet to find a landowner, land, a person that owns the land that will not let you put a container on the corner of the house or by the steps or somewhere, and it's not a problem at all. But to dig up their lawn, that might be something that they really don't want you to do. So that's one reason. Um, also, you might not want to have a half acre of garden. Um, many people, I also have the community um, youth gardens north of town here, some of them, and many people say, well, I'd like to have a half acre garden. I'm like, wow. I'd like to have a small 20 by 20 garden. Um, I think that having something small and taking care of it is much better than having a large um, weed identification plot as, as mine gets in the fall type of a thing. Also relaxation. Um, I know that sometimes, uh, not with this job, but with other jobs, sometimes I have stress. And just to get away and to work in the garden and have a sense of accomplishment after you're done really goes a long way. Also. Um, you grow what you like. It, 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 you don't have to do vegetables. You can. You can do flowers. It, it's just your type of a little environment where you have some control. And so that's um, one thing with that. Advantages. This is actually um, a nice way of looking at it. This is um, container gardening just too much, I think. Um, personally, for me, I would never do this. But if you wanted to, you could do this and have your little containers up there. Uh, many times they do this type of container gardening though when they're testing plants in containers to see how they'll do and um, go with that. Also, the one thing with these, they're very easy to take care of. For example, let's say you have um, a very nice um, or whatever tomato plant growing in there and suddenly you get a red root pigweed growing right next to it. What do you do? Do you spray it? No. You just take it, pull it out, throw it on the lawn and hit it with the lawnmower later or throw it in the garbage. It's up to you. Another thing, is if you get an infestation of aphids and you try treating it, you can't, and it just keeps getting worse and worse, you can bag up the whole thing, throw it away, and start over. Um, Why well, spend a lot of money saving something that, thanks for coming back to you, um, for, um, for that type of a thing. Creating beauty, like Tom has mentioned earlier, and I'd like to thank Tom for helping me with this presentation. Um, you create a lot of beauty in just a small space, so you have a very boring or gray area, um, no real color or anything. You can put some flowers in there and make it just fantastic in a matter of matter of minutes. Supplement your food. It depends. You know, um, this one I, I would never be able to do this with my family unless I did this type of container because we obviously eat a lot. But um, if you wanted to, let's say, gee, I really would just wish I had some cherry tomatoes once in a while, just for a salad. You could grow a cherry tomato plant in there. You can grow herbs in there. Herbs are actually quite. Um, grow quite well in container gardens, and um, I highly recommend it. Disadvantages. Um, somebody had asked me earlier about growing in metal pots. They look very nice, but when you get a very, oh, just an average okay day and the sun heats up that pot, soon what you have is sick looking, wilting, dying plants. They just get too hot in a sunny location. It can be done if you have a shady area, but most places, um, your pot will just actually cook the roots of your plant and they'll die. Um, also with that, size. Some of the um, nurseries I've noticed have these giant containers and that's fine if you decide to leave it there, but if you have a container that has 300 pounds of soil in it and decide, well, I like, not usually, you know, and not stereotypically, but this is how it goes, Todd, would you move that over about four feet that way? I said, sure, you know, I'll have a, a rupture, that'd be fine. But um, you know, you have to make it realistic. You want to make it in a container that you like. I'm very frugal, or sometimes, as people might say, cheap, but I think they don't understand the word frugal. I always have the cheap plastic gray or plastic pots or the clay pots, but you can get these beautiful ceramic pots and what have you. One reason to have a clay, plot, clay pot is, I usually ask questions of people I know, but I don't think that would work tonight. So um, you, for one reason for having a clay pot is that it will pull some of the salts through the clay out to the outside of the pot, and that's sometimes why you see you have these pots, and they're like, oh, it's kind of a white, salty look to it. And that's what they're supposed to be doing. However, if you glaze those or paint those, that stops the process, and it doesn't do that. 
Another disadvantage or one thing I want to talk about just briefly, and I'll get into it more later, is watering. Um, and we'll, we'll talk about that later, I guess. Oh, good. When you plant in these containers, the plants you get or the seeds you get are very small. Keep in mind how large they'll actually get. Now this container looks like it's adequately full, um, but if you are just to fill it full of little tiny plants, for example, let's say this is in a garden, and you might notice that I really like tomatoes. I did my master's on it, and I have nightmares about tomatoes. But um, let's say, well, I think I can get eight tomato plants in there. They'll fit nicely. It'll look beautiful, and people say, wow, look at that. However, I would say maybe one, maybe two, one would fit in a container like this. Um, reason is they grow. It's almost like the spruce tree. You get this cute little spruce tree, you either win it or buy it or whatever. It's only three, three feet tall. You put it right next to your house, and you know, a few years later, it's actually destroying part of your house because it gets too big. So keep that in mind. Also, when you're planting, it, let's say you're doing seeds. Plant the seeds according to the package directions. If it says to put them nine inches apart in the row, then do nine inches apart in the row. Don't say, well, I think I'm going to do seven. Now I'll get more in there. The problem with doing seven, when you do that type of thing, is you start to make a weed out of the plants that you're putting in there. Um, too much is not a good thing when you're planting in these containers. Sunlight, the more the better. Um, I like, if you can, get eight hours of sunlight. However, it doesn't seem to be realistic anywhere I've ever been. So I go from between six to eight. Um, many times people will say, well, I get really good morning sun. And I don't really know what that means because um, the sun, I think, is the same for everybody in, in a way here. So if you have um, sunlight in the morning, that's great. But still, two hours of sunlight in the morning is not equal to eight hours of sunlight throughout the day. Um, so keep that in mind. Also, with these containers, what you can do as far as they might get too hot in the sun, look where you have them on. If they're like, wow, these plants are really cooking, I have them on concrete, I have them on rock, on brick, whatever, next to a white fence or a white thing that's reflecting off light, you can cheat a little bit and stick a piece of wood underneath them. Concrete likes to absorb heat, and when it cools down at night, it just generates that heat right back out. And many times the plants will stay warm during the day and at night they'll get a little extra boost. I have a cheat sheet up here, by the way. Um, many of you have probably never seen this creature. It's called a rabbit. I swear there's three or four per person in Fargo, at the very minimum, at all times. Um, ferocious eaters. And the container gardens are nice, though, because you can put these high enough so these little rabbits can't get in there. If you do have them low enough, um, there are some things you can try. However, the, you know, they're, they're, they kind of defeat the purpose of having a container garden. For, for example, chicken wire works really good. But um, having a chicken wire kind of little prison for your lettuce or your whatever begonia growing in there is kind of um, not, not really as saintly as you might like. Um, plant skid sometimes is a nice thing. However, the smell um, on occasion can be a little bit overpowering with that. Insects, I talked about that earlier. One thing with the insects, if, you know, for example, one time I was looking at a, a lady's garden and she had a tomato hornworm on there. She had one on her whole, whole, uh, her whole row of plants. What should she spray with? I just squished it and said, you're done. Um, so that you, you know, it's a little bit easier to look at when you have them in a container versus um, half an acre of garden. Um, another type of creature that's a pest, slugs. Wow, ferocious eaters. I think they eat more than rabbits. Um, you want to keep that in mind when you, when you have your container down on the ground or even on a piece of wood. Maybe check it just on occasion, especially if it's been wet. If you find slugs underneath there, you can um, put on a glove or use your hand, scoop them out and throw them away. Um, They're not something you want to tolerate in your, in your garden. I wanted to tell just a quick story on how I, how I made a nice um, container garden for my, my mom when, she was, when I was living on the farm. She goes, Todd, I'd really love these container gardens. And um, I'm also going to, and this is a nice segue into my square foot little presentation I'm going to jump into quick if I keep talking fast enough here. Um, I said, well, let's get you one. She goes, well, you know, I was in college at the time, and I was about ready to leave, and we lived on a dairy farm. And if anyone who lives on a dairy farm, you always have a lot of water tanks, stock tanks around. So um, dad was gone, and I said, told my brother, go out and get the best soil you can and bring it back. And so he did with a tractor, and I took an axe and chopped holes in eight of the um, water tanks, stuck them in a nice row, filled them with soil, and I went off to college. 
and my mom was very happy, and my dad eventually forgave me, but it took, it took a while. And it's just so you can be as creative as you want with these. You can buy them or you can make them yourself. Um, at the time, it seemed like the right thing to do. We need to do stock tanks anyways. Fertilizer, uh, biggest, one of the biggest problems with fertilizer, I think, in container gardens is too much. Um, a lot of times you like to, oh, yeah, you know, I really want to do well, and you'll put in way too much. One thing that I like to use in a container garden is slow-release fertilizer. Um, simple, easy. You put it in once, and you're done. You kind of work it in with your soil, and it's just um, a fantastic product. Um, whether you want to do the organic route or not organic, I guess it's up to you. I, I use whatever's the cheapest, and um, I, I don't have a problem with that at all. Water, obviously this is not the correct type, this is an exception to the rule, this is a water garden, um, but in a container, so it's an exception, but one day's worth of water, this is like a half a year's worth of water, one day's worth of water is, it, it should hold that, it should have enough capacity to hold that, enough organic matter in there to hold that. Um, one rule of thumb with container gardening is water it every day. And, and you water so the water comes out the bottom. The reason is that when the water comes out the bottom, it pulls some of the salts with it and helps to keep that a little bit um, less salty, I guess. Um, some people I've talked with said, well, I always water so it only goes down four inches and I use all the water. I never waste any water. And then we'll dig in there and it'll just be like, almost like a whitish layer in there. And they said, what's that from? I said, well, after several years of having this and, and never really changing it or anything, you create a, a slight salt layer, and when you add water and it gets down there, you now create a salty type of environment that's hard on the plant. Um, I'm going to refer the questions to later because I want to get into this next handout, which is not on a PowerPoint. I'm gonna, can everyone see this, Scott? I'm assuming. It's the H1597, the facts of square foot gardening um, talk. and the square foot gardening method, um, one thing I really enjoy about that is, is it doesn't really waste a lot of resources. For example, when you water a garden, say it was um, 20 by 20, the walk paths get water. The walk paths get fertilizer. The walk paths get sunlight. There's weeds growing up. There's, there's a lot of, lot of extra things you, you seem to be wasting. Now, when you use a square foot method, and if you do it correctly, don't overplant it, you have no walk paths, and you don't waste the water or fertilizer that you, you might in other, in other gardening situations. <clears throat> Another thing that I like about raised beds um, and square foot gardening type of project is that you can make them to, to basically work for anyone. Um, for example, if you have someone like my mom who is not able to really bend over very well, I made them at table height. That's how tall the stock tanks were because the cattle could drink that high. So I didn't really make them that high. It just happened to be that way. Um, and so she would just stand there, walk by, and pull weeds, and it's great. She still uses those today. Um, and, and it's wonderful. If you have somebody that's in a wheelchair, you can tailor it to them. You know, you can work with them and get it so that it works well with them. I, I chose at home to use them at six to eight inches high because I like a lot of back pain. I don't know why I didn't follow my own directions, but um, that's what I did. As far as what type of soil to put in these and in the containers, it, it's basically up to you. If you have the option, I'd like to try different types of soil. You know, make your own mixes, talk to other people. Um, you know, you'll make mistakes, but that's all right. It's a, it's a small area. Just tr talk to other people, find out what worked for them, and, and go with that. <coughs> Another, one other thing with um, raised beds and square foot gardening is rotating. It's easy to rotate because, gee, last year I remember I had little cucumbers along the fence here, and then I got peas right next to the fence and other things. Um, easy to rotate, especially if you keep records. Um, Tom, do I have more time, Tom? Or? Okay, thank you. Sometimes I don't know where to stop, so I have to kind of pace myself a little bit. All right, I can always buy more time. Um, some things that, that to keep in mind that probably wouldn't work well with you, sweet corn. Sweet corn in a little four by four garden um, really is, is a difficult thing. It needs wind pollination, takes up a lot of resources. I wouldn't recommend that. Um, 
the type of thing. And, 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 one, and people always ask me, why do you always say four foot? Why four foot? You know, most people can reach out two feet, adults. Now, people will say, well, we do five feet. It's like, well, that's great. Maybe you're taller. I don't know. But most people can do four, four feet or two feet reach out. So if you have a, um, a raised bed or a container garden that's in a, or not a container garden, but a raised bed garden, have it four feet wide, and it's a lot easier to work with than if it's five or greater. And then have it as long as you want. In California, a few years back, um, they used a lot of these for the lettuce industry, and, and they did quite well. Um, with these types of raised bed gardens. So. Okay, how about we start with some questions? Thank you. We can remember that the audience up there cannot hear the yep. questions, so we please repeat them. Okay, the thank you. Raised beds is, are railroad ties um, that are treated, are they suitable for making raised beds? When I was in South Dakota, I, I had a. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Um, the question was raised beds and railroad ties. Um, when I was in South Dakota, I had a beautiful rose garden, and I used railroad ties. It was fantastic. I, I, I challenge anyone to find a better thing for roses. However, vegetables, I'm not a big fan. Um, for the raised beds, especially with vegetables, I, w I prefer pine, um, very cheap and expensive, block or brick, cedar if you have extra money. Um, there's some plastic ones that you can now get. However, the, the pressure-treated pressure treated lumber is nice, um, but anything that has maybe arsenic or, or, or some kind of chemical free assault, I, I don't like. Um, I have concerns that there might be potential long-term or short-term cancers with those, so I, wouldn't, I would never use those. Okay, a question about this person's already growing stuff. They're growing radishes in the container. Oh, great. It's uh, not so great. Oh. 70 degrees, grow light, and good soil. But the plants are two inches tall and spindly. I'm assuming it's in the state here. So the question is. The question was, the person is growing radishes now in their home, I'm assuming, or someplace, 70 degrees with grow lights in containers, and they're tall and spindly. I would say they're not getting the right light spectrum, the color, um, infrared or red. I always forget which one it is. They're not getting the full spectrum of light like they should. If you have the older fluorescent bulbs, you want a cool bulb and a warm bulb. Right. Right, but they need the um, correct spectrum. So I don't think they're getting the correct spectrum with that, and um, they need to improve that by adding some more, some more of the color spectrum. And I'm assuming you can still get them like the warm, warm bulbs, they used to call them. You can get those and try those. Otherwise, um, I've been told, but I don't know if it's true or not, that the LEDs have the full color spectrum. So they need to change their lighting if they want to change that. Can you give a recommendation on a good variety of tomatoes for container garden? Can I give a, I got the question this time. It takes me a, few, a little while. Um, can I give a good recommendation for tomatoes with container gardening? Um, what I would do if you want to be successful with container gardening and tomatoes, I would grow some of the cherry tomatoes and I grow hybrid cherries, things of that nature. You can maybe try like the, the, the heirloom yellow plum, little tiny plum ones. But I would try to grow the hybrid tomatoes because they are very successful, prolific. And even if you got half the crop that you would in the garden, you wouldn't even notice. Um, some of these bigger ones, like I've tried beef steak and such, and um, you might get them. And they're not really going to be what you, you know, as many as you want. You might say you get like six versus in a garden you get 20 or 40 or what have you. Um, I would stay with the smaller varieties and go with hybrid to be successful. Okay, the next question is can you plant asparagus in containers? I would not plant asparagus in containers. Um, asparagus likes a cool, dormant season and um, a container, and plus the roots get um, quite large. I. Um, made the mistake, um, somebody said, hey, when I was younger, would you like an asparagus plant? Come on over. And I did. And um, the, the few stocks that came up, the root system was at least this big. And they take two full grown men to lift it. Um, the roots will get so big after a while in, in a container. Um, unless you have a giant one and you, no, I still wouldn't do it. I, I wouldn't do it. I, I don't think they would um, survive more than one season. Looks like a tough crowd, so I'm near the door. 
and I'm ready to go. I, I have no fear of running out the door. <laughs> okay. Okay, how about bind weed in raised beds? What can we, what can we do about that? Bind weed? Bind weed problem in raised beds. Well, what I would do is just pull it out and throw it away. <laughs> Thank you for that. Well, I, you know, some of these, ra some of these, you know, you know, these raised beds, if they're that big and you can't control them and get such a high weed pressure, sometimes you have to start over. You know. I agree. But you know. Nobody can hear me, but this is one of the benefits of raised beds. It's yeah. so, so loose. So we pop out. Okay, how about I've got a comment about strawberries over the wind train in the raised bed? I I've been proven wrong on that. For years I said you yeah, couldn't Oh, sorry. <laughs> I should have a sock puppet with me. Um what the question was, how about strawberries in a raised bed? And I've been proven wrong with that. A friend of mine, um, Built a raised bed, got some of the insulation, and I, I think it's called pink. It's just a hard, thick stuff that they put around the, out, the outside of their, can, of their raised bed, and they put strawberries in the middle and fill it with soil, and it's three feet high. And they said, next year I'll have great strawberries. They said, they'll all be dead. And sure enough, they all lived and looked wonderful. And um, I think if you're going to do that, you have to have enough soil or enough insulation protection to keep them alive. When it's out of the ground like that, the roots tend to freeze and have a hard time. But if, it, if there's adequate enough soil for a buffer from the snow and what ha or from the cold, then I think you, you, you could do it. Okay. Um, this question about growing geranium in containers. Can you talk about overwintering them from one year to the next? Uh, geraniums are, are pretty easy. It seems you can almost do everything with them, and, and they, they tend to overwinter. They get pretty unsightly. Um, one thing that I do, I just I just cut them down and let them kind of go dormant, and I put them in a cool, somewhat dark area, and I'll check them once in a while, and I'll water them. And next spring, I'll really give them a good dosing of water, and they seem to come back nice. Um, it's one of those plants that I like because even I can keep it going. I don't play around. I play around with it too much. Most things die, but a geranium is fairly forgiving. So I think that... Um, you'd be fine almost with anything that you did, as long as you brought it in the house. If you left it outside, I think you'd, you would have nothing. Next question is, do you have a general recommendation on the depth of a container? Do I have a general recommendation on the depth of the container? I had a lot of people just staring at me, so I knew to ask the question back. Um, <clears throat> as far as the depth, I, I, the deeper the better. Um, if you can have a tomato growing in a, in a container that's as high as this table, that's great. It's maybe a little bit overkill for a container, maybe half that size would be tolerable, but the deeper the better. Um, a lot of times I'll see containers and they're beautiful, they're long and wide, there's like two inches for soil in there, and, and you really can't grow much of anything. Um, I would say the deeper the better. So as far as how deep, at a minimum, if you, just on a general for most plants, I would say eight inches. But if you wanted to actually grow something, like, like that's for, you know, some annual flowers and such, but if you want to grow something larger or if you want to grow vegetables, I would try a couple feet deep, easily. How about the comment about growing perennials in a raised bed? If you have it wide enough, uh, I'm sorry, <laughs> I am not easily trained, ask anyone. Um, the, the, I'm all flustered. How about growing perennials in a raised bed? Um, the problem is, is that you have to keep it warm enough. I think if you had like a berm type of a thing, or maybe it's eight feet wide and the perennials were down the middle, you'd have no problem. But if you had, um, you know, one a four by four, maybe down the middle, you could grow some perennials. The problem is the roots get so cold they can't handle it and they they break. So it's not ideal. You could try insulating it like it, my friend did to prove me wrong. A lot of people like to do that. Um, you can try that, but um, it's an extra expense. That's all I got. Anybody here? Doesn't look like there's any here. <laughs> Go ahead. How do you keep rabbits out of your garden? How do you keep rabbits out of your garden? We moved into our new place, chain link fence. I put a, a chicken wire around it, and they jumped right through the chain link. I don't think they have bones. They just boom. And so then a year after that, I had to put chicken wire. I, I use chicken wire to keep them out of the garden here. I can't, I can't grow anything without chicken wire. 
I, sometimes I grow flowers, um, rabbits versus a garden. How do you keep them out? Um, chicken wire, um, I don't think dogs have any real value with rabbit control. I've seen the dogs, they're sleeping, the rabbits come up and lay on them. It is, it's just terrible. So. We bought some flower pots anticipating spring and they have no holes in the bottom. Should drainage holes be drilled in? Um, he said there is some. He bought some flower pots in anticipation of spring, and there's no drainage holes. Yeah, I, I would definitely drill some holes in there if you can. Um, might have to take the plant out first, or if you just take a chance and break them. Otherwise, you're gonna have some problems. So was it him or you that bought it? We're talking about. It. I was kind of wondering. Is yes. The great, not, not that the question isn't great, but um, do you have to dig down chicken wire around your plant, your, your vegetable garden? Yes. Um, otherwise, they'll just wiggle their way underneath. Uh, three inches maybe. Yeah. It depends if you're in West Fargo or if you have jackrabbits. I don't think you can get it tall enough. You always have to encase it in wire. But um, we have the little cotton tails here. Um, I, I go about maybe waist high. And if you get more than that, they'll jump right in. And then they get trapped in there and they, they just eat, nothing bothers them, and they get really big and you have to lift them out. Any last questions? They're coming out with a big hook to not snap my neck, but I'm out of here. I gotta go over here. Okay, thank you, Todd. And okay, it's about 8:30, so we're shutting down the formal part, but we are going into overtime as promised. And we will address some questions that we didn't get to address earlier. And um, so we're going to first get our first speaker, Dave. We have a few questions on soil. Can you handle that? Maybe if you just hold the microphone like this. Tell me that. We good? I'll do my best. I can't do worse than Todd. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I got the wire underneath the fence. I'm good. Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, they don't last forever. Uh, you start. They don't last forever. <laughs> yeah, that that yes didn't ask your question. It really isn't that easy. No, it's not. It's great to have an audience, but then when you have an audience, you just figure everybody can hear you. So the question was, how how often do you have to replace the Lincoln logs? They last for about ten years. I have the pressure treated, non arsenic. Um, Lincoln logs, and they last about 10 years, then you have to start replacing them. How about a question about garden soil that's next to an evergreen tree? The garden's covered with needles. Should they be worried? Yeah, so the question was if you have a, a garden next to an evergreen tree, you have needles, uh, what I would do would uh, periodically, like every three, four years or so, I would have a soil test done with pH. And if you if you started out like you would say in the Minot area down through Bismarck, where you you're already working with a soil that maybe has a six six five pH or so, over time lots of needles you you create some acidity, and you might have to add some lime over time. That, that's the only issue I can think of. Okay. Um, anyone know they love your soil math. And they're wondering about what would be the best percentages of clay, silt, and sand. Okay, so the ideal would be something in. What? Dang. <laughs> <laughs> I'm only batting 33% now. Okay, so the question was okay, the, the soil triangle, uh, what's the ideal soil? So an ideal soil would be down into that loam and you know, the higher clay part of the sandy loam. That would be my ideal soil. If I was granted that to start a garden, I would be really happy 
probably wouldn't even think about raised beds except for my back. That's really nice. But so so the percentage of sand, silt, and clay in that is roughly somewhere in the neighborhood of 40 to 40 to 50 percent sand, around 20, 25 percent clay, around 20, 25 percent silt, somewhere in that neighborhood of sand, silt, and clay. Next question has to do with what do you feel about adding wood ashes in compost? Okay, so the question was how about wood ashes in compost? Well, that's how the term potash came to be. So potash is what was left after they got done burning wood, which is a lot of potassium. So uh, it's um, you would think that maybe it would be an organic amendment, but it's really not. I mean, those ashes are all burned up. The microbes aren't going to do anything to them at all. It tends to be a little bit alkaline. So if you already have an alkaline soil, you're going to have some alkalinity, uh, more alkalinity to deal with. It might uh, be helpful maybe in that needle situation where it's uh, neutralizing the, the acid a little bit, then it would contain some potassium in very, really small amounts of things like phosphate, but not, not anything you even consider. So it would be kind of a neutral factor. You know, I, I'm not, you know, it would be maybe a way to get rid of them without setting your garbage can on fire, um, which some people do. But um, uh, as far as being real helpful to the com compost, it's uh, neutral, just kind of neutral. What do you feel about buying soil testing kits? Okay, so the question was soil testing kits. It kind of gets you in the ballpark, but you don't know where your seed is. You know what I mean? You know, so you kind of have an idea that maybe maybe it's high-ish or maybe it's really low-ish, but you're really not sure about where. There's really no calibration that goes along with those things at all. Uh, having a soil test down at NDSU or AgVice or whoever your local person is that has soil testing in your region uh, is probably a better better way to go because they, they have some general recommendations in order to go along with the numbers. Um, how about composting? Should you aerate or mix it every year? Or is that just the last thing for a couple of years? Okay, so with a compost pile, the question was, is it best to turn it uh, once a year or every few years, or what would you do? I would, I would probably turn it two, three times a season. Uh, you, you have to think about what the little critters are doing on the side of there, and they have to breathe too. And so mixing them with some air uh, increases the rate of the composting and makes a better compost when you get done. Do you want to talk about uh, milestones? I, I don't know what milestone is. My question was, am I comfortable with milestone herbicide? I'm, I'm talking about the degradation of that, and I, and I have no idea. Thank you. Okay, we still got more overtime here. I got a few more questions. And since we have a lot of these questions, I'm getting a lot of questions that aren't really, uh, some of them aren't really targeted at the topic. So these are kind of more general questions. And that's why we're so fortunate tonight to have a generalist like Todd Weinman here to answer some of these questions. Todd, so I'm going to put you on the spot. I got a few questions for you, buddy. I've never been a general before. <laughs> This is kind of good. <laughs> the generals have to repeat questions. I thought someone else had to. Uh, the comment was, or the question was, um, for saving carryover seeds. Um, yeah, it, it can be done. There's a right way and a wrong way, of course. Um, not in everything in between. What I would say is if. For example, if you were going to save seeds, and let's just pick um, tomatoes, um, if you're going to do that, I would only save them from heirloom or pure strain varieties. Uh, the reason being is, and, and that is if they were not grown in near proximity and no bees or anything or wind or whatever pollinated them so that they um, now are, have crossbred um, genetics in their, in their tomato seeds. Um, for example, if you grow a, a hybrid tomato and 
It's beautiful. You just love it. It's the best tomatoes you've ever had, and they're just perfect and everything else. And you save the seeds from that, and you plant those hybrid seeds. Next year, you will not get that. You you will not get that at all. You'll get some. You'll get a tomato, but it, it might be they might be small. They might be big. You, you really don't know. Now that the heirloom um, varieties are ones that can be saved, and then you um, so you spread them out and they dry out. Uh, and probably you know do it someplace. Um, there's ways of doing it with water too. Um, so if you're just saving a few, though, it's kind of disgusting with the water method. But if you're just saving a few, um, dry them off, let them sit. And then I would um, take and um, once they're, they look dry, I'd stick them in a Ziploc bag and I'd throw them in a the freezer. And then next spring I'd use them. The freezer is a nice way of saving the seed because it slows down their respiration and their germination. Um, it will go down a little bit, but um, not as much as if you kept them in your house over winter. And then maybe two years later you left them in the garage. And then now they're, you know, they've been cooking and, and it just wouldn't be as good. So I hope that answered the question. But, um, oh, yeah, I did. I, yeah, that's not a very good thing. How about um, how can you protect trees and their precious bark from deer damage? Trees versus um, deer damage. Uh, very difficult. I know that in town, um, some places on the river, um, first moved here. People would come, come look at a beautiful little deer in the, in the backyard, you know, we just love them. And by fall, they're like, oh, what can we do to keep these out of here? Um, deer are very, very good at eating the, the bark and many other things. You can try plant skid, you can try chicken wire, um, just try to keep them out of it. it. It's not an easy thing, especially if you have more than three or four and there's deer around. They'll climb up on the snow, they stand on their back legs, they can just graze on it. So it's very, very difficult. I, I don't have a, a great perfect answer for that. Okay, let's try this one then. <laughs> Tom made these up, dang it. If you have a porcupine and <laughs> it's in your sewer and Yeah. Okay, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Should we stake a young tree or not? I, pr I, I actually I don't I'm not a big fan of staking young trees. I like to grow them kind of tough. Now, if you have a larger tree and it, you just touch it or look at it, it tips over, I'd stake some stakes on there. But what I would do is I would stake it so that I wouldn't use wire on it or, or something else. I'd take like a t-shirt and I, I'd put just a t-shirt on one side, t-shirt on the side, snug but not tight, and I'd put it on the stake and there it would be. The reason I use a t-shirt because it'll rot. And so next year when you forget about it and you're at a wedding, instead of a tight wire being pulled on, on the bark and, and slowly ripping the tree apart, the t-shirt will rot and fall apart and three years later you say, oh, I should have took that off and it's already off. So if you, you don't have to stake a small tree, if you can help it, that'd be the best. But if you have to, because you're in a wind tunnel or whatever, um, no more than a year should be, should be adequate. And if it's larger than that, then you might have to reconsider something else, I guess. A few more questions. If you take out an old tree, can you plant a new one in the same spot? I always call before you dig just to throw that out there so you don't get electrocuted or cut somebody's phone line and they come over and talk to you. Um, not that I've done that, but I've heard stories. A gas lines, everything you could think of was buried on the ground. I don't even know if there's soil in some spots, but call before you dig. So you got a tree, you cut it down, there's nothing there. Can you find another tree there? You have to grind out the root probably. Um, get rid of, so you don't have a mushroom factory later, which are probably poisonous. You get rid of that, you add new soil. I don't see a problem with it. Sometimes, however, if you're growing a tree in one spot, say you had a, an apple tree there, and it's been there for 30 years. And you say, I would put one right next to where it was. It might be a little low on nutrients that an apple would care for, so you might have to I'd add some fresh soil around there just to kind of give it a, give it a little boost. I move a lot when I talk. I didn't realize that. Go ahead. The next question is, they had an old tree, and but it was flooded. The leaves are very yellow. But that's what it. They, do about it. they have an old tree, and it's been flooded, and the leaves are yellow. Well, I would check this spring to see if it, if it's alive yet. Um, be your first step. Now, there really isn't anything I can think of that you can do to work with that. Um, Check and see if the buds swell, if they break bud, and if they're yellow, I would take some to your local extension office and describe what happened. It might not be anything to do with the flooding. It might be something else. More likely it is, but not necessarily. Um, just because a tree's leaves are yellow doesn't mean it's exactly what you think it is. There's a number of different things that can cause that. So um, there's nothing really to do for it right now at this time. 
Um, are you comfortable with that amount of some questions? No. Okay. I'm comfortable with it. Can you just say over the microphone with a question about milestone? It can have a five year result. It can have up to five years. Okay. And in a raised bed situation, they can claim being as a as a Maybe I'll have you do that, Tom. Okay, um, all right. Am I on? Um, the question was on milestone, and um, with some help from Tom, uh, a five year residual, I was told, up to five years, and then you can plant beans, is that correct? Beans is a bioassay sensitive crop. Just dump the soil and start over. Uh, how about broccoli question? I love broccoli. How about uh, the broccoli plant blooms with flowers and then for me for as expected? The, um, the, well, well the, the question was um, the broccoli, it sounded like it bolted. It, 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 it um, went right into flowers, very few florets. Um, Sometimes that can happen with um, different environmental stresses, not enough water, maybe way too hot. I do know one thing though, um, it's a very underutilized garden, garden plant. Um, if you plant broccoli here, it will do very well. I, I'm always amazed at how well broccoli does and how few people grow it. But I, I imagine a lot of people don't like the flavor of it, but I do. I always throw out two broccoli plants and it's a, it's a great plenty for the fall. You, you harvest it off, you clip off the heads. And then you wait and you get another second crop on it. It's a wonderful plant to grow. And if it bolted, I, last year I tried to remember what kind you had and maybe try a different variety and see if that improves it or not. Okay, how about, uh, let's see the last question. Okay, the person has a flower bed near an ash tree and it is full of ash seedlings. What can we do about it? Person has a flower bed next to an ash tree and it's full of ash seedlings. Um, basically, you can just pull and pull and pull until they're all gone. Might take a couple hundred years, I think, but um, or else what you could do is remove the soil. Um, the thing with seeds is an interesting thing. Not all seeds will germinate the next year and different things. Um, for example, and this will get off the topic a little bit, but maybe I could put it in perspective, a lady grew some amaranth, or basically what we know as redwood or um, pigweed, and um, beautiful ornamental, fantastic wine, burgundy color, and it produces one million seeds per plant. The good thing is only 500,000 are viable in most, most averages. So you only have 500,000, um, they all drop because you didn't harvest it in time, and now you have 500,000 um, potential seeds for next year. Not all of them will germinate next year. Some will germinate later. Some will germinate later after that. You now have amaranth basically forever because um, you'll forget it again. So um, same thing with these seeds. Not all of them are going to, I don't know about specifically with ash, but in most cases when you have a, a large volume of seeds in a soil, the only thing that I can say would be to either replace it or um, Try to sterilize it maybe with plastic, dark plastic. I don't know. Pull them out by hand. You know, it's um, it's labor of law, a lot of work. Move, move to a new location. <laughs> Sell your home and move. Should put rock. Should you use rock or crushed cans in a container for good drainage? Um, in the past, a lot of people. There was a time when that was the big thing to do. That I don't know if it was just to hide cans or what, or, rock, or make it heavy so it doesn't tip over. I prefer soil. When the plant hits that rock. It doesn't really get any nutrients out of that with the root. Now, if there's soil there, it still can utilize that and such. Um, if your container is that light or is always windy, you can maybe throw in something to kind of keep it down. Um, but preferably, I would use soil. I wouldn't use the other if your container doesn't flip over. Some of these large containers, you know, as tall as me, and one plant growing on the top, maybe you want to fill it up with large empty pot bottles or something halfway, just so you don't have so much soil, but still, it would be better to have the soil in there than not. I, I prefer the soil over the, uh, the other ones. Okay, last question. The third last question. 
that's a very enthusiastic crowd. I pay a lot of these people. Um, can you give me the positive and negative of dairy tree leaves for use as an organic amendment to garden soil? Using tree leaves as an amendment to garden soil. Using tree leaves as an amendment to garden soil. Um, okay, pros and cons. I, I like using tree leaves. There are some exceptions. Um, I don't like using black walnut. It has alleochemical properties. And um, you try to grow something next year, let's say tomatoes, um, they die. They just can't handle it. The, the plant has, through time, produced this chemical to kill other plants. It, it's a competitive type of thing. So um, also, sometimes people, I got this poplar, and um, you know, we put in you know, 17 inches of leaves in the garden. It's too much. Um, if you're going to do leaves, maybe just um, a few inches, rototill them in or work them in. Better to compost them, but if you don't, um, and you just work them in, the thing with it is, is the carbon to nitrogen ratio is too high. And the first year you do that, it's like, gee, this is horrible. Nothing's really doing anything. My neighbor's is great. Look at that. Blah, blah, blah. But um, after a while, it, and I did this at, um, when I was growing up too, another experiment, I dumped tree leaves on our garden for five years. The first four years was quite horrible. The fifth year, you couldn't find better soil. And what had happened is the flora, the fauna, the micro, microbes in there finally broke down a lot of that um, leaf matter, died themselves, and were able to use by the plants as food. So it takes a while. You might be able to add nitrogen to that um, to kind of speed that up, but it'd be kind of a... I guess how much time you want to do with it, I guess. So. Thank you. So fortunate to have a general all-purpose horticulturist here. Okay. Uh, you got at least five more minutes. Okay, that's it for everybody tonight. Thank you so much.